So before we get into slides, does anyone have any questions? Any, anything open that needs to be addressed? When's the class we can relax in? What's the class you can relax in? Yeah, when, when is that? Um, I don't know, after you graduate maybe? <laughs> In this class, in this semester, in 116, I do have an answer for that. The last two weeks of the semester, you can chill. Uh, the last two weeks are all review because I can't, I can't cover anything in those lectures and then also have a lab where I assess you on it. So the content has to shut off after the third to last week. So those weeks you can chill. Uh, but yeah, up till then, it's topic after topic after topic. We're actually looking to cut a few topics from 116 so we can chill a little bit more in the schedule. But. I was actually going to ask something about that. For the final, uh, we don't have to take it, right? And now the review, yeah. I, I'm going to guess, is angled at the final. Are, is attendance still mandatory for those? No, attendance is not mandatory for the last two weeks, and I won't have lecture questions. Uh, the review, uh, for that week, the review is not necessarily angled at the final exam, though. Uh, so I'll do some final exam review during those last two weeks, but what I typically do... Um, is, just to be clear what we're talking about, uh, what I typically do is just leave it up to the class. So we have these review weeks. One day is going to be LO4 review because we don't have any room in the lab schedule for LO4 review. So that's going to be in class on Monday. So we get it before the second chance, uh, the second chance LO4 because the first and second chance are back to back for LO4. So review is in lecture instead of in lab. Uh, so besides that, I just have five lectures that are labeled review, and it's it's whatever for those weeks. What I typically do is put a make a post on Piazza and say whatever's the highest upvoted comment on this post, that's what I'm doing, and then I just leave it up to what all of you you do. So if if uh, and then I'll pick like in theory the top five out of that list, and that's what I'll cover in lecture, and then in practice usually I'll cover a couple in a day and cover like the top ten. Um, so if you all ask for final exam review, that's what I'll do. If you all say, you know, anything else, that's what I'll do. Uh, within reason, of course, but I've never had something out of that was not within reason uh, make the top several slots. Uh, but that's generally what I do. We actually just talked about this with the TAs. The TAs want to take one of those lectures and talk about... Um, well, I don't want to say anything because I don't know what they're going to land on, but... Uh, See us like your degree and career opportunities like as a whole, like zoom out of 116 and talk about that kind of stuff. So the TAs want to talk about uh, that for a lecture. So we can expect that. But like four lectures where it's just open-ended, whatever. And again, if you all actually want final exam review, I'll review final exam stuff. Uh, if not, it's whatever. Uh, but we got a ways to go until then. Uh, but no lecture questions, no required attendance or anything for these. It's all... Uh, it's all optional. No lecture questions. I should talk to Paul about that. I don't know if he plans on doing lecture questions those last two weeks. Even if he does, I won't. But, uh, uh, but that's what's up for the last two weeks. So those are definitely the chill weeks. Uh, historically, uh, one of the things I do is I have, uh, I have this game. I think I showed this in lecture before. But I have this game deployed. Uh, it's a big like MMO tower offense game. And you attack the, the uh, attack the tower. That's written entirely with 116 code. It's written in Scala. It's all code that you would be able to write, but it's a lot. It actually used to be a homework to build that thing, and it was way too much. Uh, so I, it's not a homework anymore. It was a two-part homework, to be fair, but homeworks were weekly also at the time, so it was a two-week homework. Um, so I like to go through that and show what you can build with what you know. So I may do that. Uh, we did cut one of the topics, so you can't actually, I guess you can't do that now, but I could explain that topic over the review week. Uh, so I like going through that and showing you how you could build something like that and deploy it to the internet and everything. Uh, but if there's no demand for that, I won't do that either. Uh, if, if there's, I shouldn't say it that way. If there's something else you would want to see more than that, I'll cover that instead. Anything else anybody wants to talk about before we get into slides? All right, let's get into slides. Immutability. Uh, I, we, Paul and I talked last week about this. 
uh, and we want to scale back immutability too. This is one of the topics we, we want to cut from the course entirely. Uh, so since that's our attitude towards this topic, we're scaling it back this semester. I'm going to have uh, probably just this lecture on immutability. And you will get a quiz question on immutability, but it will be roughly the same complexity as what we're going to see today. We're not going to throw anything too crazy at you on the quiz for this uh, or on the interview. Uh, it won't be too wild. But the idea of immutability, you should understand. Uh, but I can cover that in one lecture. And then the rest of this week, I'll probably still kind of talk about immutability. Immu uh, uh, I can't even say it. This is why I want to cut the topic. Uh, but with recursion, and even today has recursion in it, because with immutability, it kind of begs the, uh, the idea of recursion quite a bit. So the rest of this week, I just want to talk about recursion more and more but maybe with immutability as a backdrop. So what is immutable? Immutability and specifically immutable objects is what we want to talk about today. Immutability itself is using val instead of var. So we're embracing that on homework per, quite deeply um, in that sense, that we have immutability in the, the homework. Immutable objects is when those state variables also have to be values. So we haven't seen an object or, or a class yet where we're creating objects of that type where the state of them, those objects cannot change. And we have one of those for our homework. We have the song class, and we create objects of type song, but they can't change. And for objectives, uh, for tasks one and two, you don't have to change them. When you're reading the files, you create song objects by the last, um, the last method of tasks one and two. You're creating songs, but you're saying new song with this list with one rating, and then you never change anything with that song ever. And then when we get to task three, you're going to have to write methods to be able to add ratings to those songs. So how do we add those ratings to a song when the ratings can't change? The, uh, the song rating class, the rating and the energy value, uh, the energy level, those are both vales. You can't change them. Uh, you can't change the list. That's a vale in the song class. So how do we add a rating to a song? That's what we want to talk about today. So how are we going to mat, uh, mess with these immutable objects? So everything, every state variable, like their entire thing on the heap, is never going to change. Uh, and there's a big advantage to this is that you know it's not going to change. So since you know it's not going to change, you never have to worry about it changing. So if you're ever worried about the values of your objects changing, you worry about that a lot, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, where this is really useful is with concurrent code and distributed systems, which we don't do in, in 116. We used to do concurrency, uh, but not anymore. Is if you have two pieces of code using the same data and accessing the same object on the heap simultaneously, and one of them is changing the data while the other one's reading it, that's just asking for trouble. And this is uh, a common problem we have with concurrent code in multi-threading and distributed systems and everything is called concurrent writes. What if two pieces of code are trying to change the state of an object simultaneously? Which one wins? Which change sticks? What if they're both trying to append to a list? Do we get both those values like we want, or do we just get one of them because they were both working with the same initial list and then appending to it and overwriting the list? These are big problems that we have. And immutability just says, well, don't let them change the state of the object. Problem solved. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a very strong solution to that problem, but a very useful one. If you have a big distributed systems with multiple servers, all with multi-threading and concurrent code, all messing with the same data, uh, this is a feature that we really like, having immutable objects. We know that no one process and one machine on one thread is going to change that data unexpectedly because it's immutable. We just don't have to worry about it. Uh, so that's why we like immutability. Uh, you'll really see the benefits of it taking courses like distributed systems and 305 programming languages. We'll talk about this and see more of the benefits of it as well. I believe is that. I believe that's true. I don't remember exactly what they do in that class these days. Uh, so what if we actually want to change the state? So with our song class, we have to add ratings to it. How do we do that if it's immutable? That's crazy. And what we're going to do is create an entire copy of that object with the change applied. So I'm not going to add a rating to that song object on the heap. I'm going to create a brand new song object with the additional rating added to it. 
And then I'm going to use that reference of the new song that was created as the song with the rating added. So the old song without the rating added still exists on the heap, and any pieces of my code that have a reference to that old song still maintain the integrity of that data unchanged by my change, uh, but I can see the change and they don't see the change, and we both have immutable objects that we know aren't going to change by creating copies of the objects. So I have this about the simplest thing we can do, just like my, my first recursion example, except we won't go any more complex than this on immutability except the song class, uh, which is about as complex, if, uh, if I'm being honest. Uh, I have a class here with one state variable, which is an int, and I have methods to be able to either increase or decrease that int by one. So I have some object that I want to act as a counter, which is going to store some number, and I can either increase that number by one or decrease that number by one while embracing immutability. When I create this state variable, we have three options when creating state variables. So a little review, we can either use val, var, or neither. I chose neither here. When we choose neither, we, what we get is a val, so it can't change, so it is immutable. But this also can't be read from outside of this class. This is a little artificial. This is kind of like banning var and, and uh, banning conditionals. It's a little artificial, but I want because we can make this val and then make our lives easier for the next thing that I want to do. But I'm going to not give access to this value outside of the class. And then we have to call either increase or decrease whenever we want to change the counter. And then since we don't have access to counter, I have one method to be able to print it to the screen just so we can see what the current value of counter is, or else it would be a completely hidden value and wouldn't be of any use to us. So one method to be able to print that counter. So these are the only three times counter can be accessed is by calling one of these three methods. No other code is able to access the raw value counter, that integer value. Nobody can access it. We can only call increase to have it increased by one, call decrease to have it decreased by one, or print it to the screen. Yeah, not in this class. You don't have to worry about space running out. So how do we actually use this class to actually be a counter? Which, of course, we wouldn't do something like this. We would just have an int uh, and use the value of the int. Um, so this whole thing is pretty artificial. But we're going to use it by calling these methods. These methods are going to change the value of the counter by creating a new object with the change applied. So we're going to create a new instance of this class, a new object of type immutable counter with the new value. So I'm updating the value of counter, returning a new immutable object, and that's what this method returns. So it returns a reference to a new object of type immutable counter with the update applied, with that increase or decrease applied to it. So I still have the original immutable counter, but I have a new one with that plus one or minus one to the counter. Of course, it's the same thing you want to do in the song class. Return a new song with that extra rating added to it, appended to that list or prepended to the list. And then to complete our example, if we want to call, if we want to use this code, we're going to call increase and decrease. That's going to return a new counter with the increase or decrease applied. And my next question is, well, what if we want to increase or decrease this multiple times? What if I want to write code that's going to increase the counter 20 times? Now, I could cut and paste increase 20 times. I do counter dot increase dot increase dot increase 20 times. But what if I want to increase this by a variable amount of time? What if I want to ask my end user, hey, how many times do you want to increase this value? And they type in a number and send it to me, and I want to increase it that many times. I can't cut and paste that because I don't know what number they're going to say. So how do I build this dynamically to be able to increase any number of times? That's the next goal that we want to use, uh, mostly so I can talk about recursion. So to do that, we're going to write a recursive method And I'm throwing all this at you right away, but we're going to spend the rest of the lecture looking at this code example. So if it's a bit much all at once, you know, it's fine. Uh, I threw a lot of, you know, I threw 
30 or so lines of code at you right there. Uh, that's fine. We're going to spend the rest of the lecture talking about this example. So now I want to update a counter 20 times. So what I want is a new counter with the value 10. I'm going to initialize that value 10 and then create that counter, have a reference to that counter. I want to call my update counter method and ignoring what it actually does for now, this update counter, what I expect it to do is add 20 to this value and return a new counter that's the value of this counter plus 20. So this counter has a value of 10. Its counter variable is 10. I want to add 20 to that counter and return a new counter with the value 30. So when I print counter to the screen, I should get 10. That's immutable. So this 10 for this reference to this counter, that's always going to be 10 because it's immutable. It can't change. It can never change. I never have to worry about that thing where two variables refer to the same object and one of them is making a change so we can ch see the change from the other variable. We never have to worry about that with immutability. Counter, no matter what happens in between here, I know this is going to be 10. Always, always, always. It's a val, so I can't have this variable refer to a different object at any point in time. And that object's counter variable is a val, so that counter can't change at any time. So I don't care what happens in this code, counter.print count is always going to print 10. Always, always, always. It can't change. I shouldn't say always, always, always. There are ways to break things. Uh, you can use reflection to override the, the accessibility to counter and then change it, even though it's a value. You can do things like that. Um, we're not going <laughs> to. But, uh, but uh, that's going to print out 10 in any normal circumstances. And then counter 2, we expect to print out 30. So that's what we expect to happen here. This is what we want to happen. And we're going to call this recursive method to be able to get that done. This recursive method handles positive and negative. I think I'll actually just go to the, the next, uh, uh, when we get to the memory diagram, that's when I'll talk about this, uh, how this method works. Uh, because I cut down the code a little bit so it doesn't have to handle negatives just so I can fit it on the slide better. Oh, or I'm going to have a slide to talk about it now. So lists in Scala are immutable. Lists in Scala are immutable. So whenever you made a change, I'll come back to that example, don't worry, but I, I don't want to forget about these lists, so I put these slides right in the middle of the, the lecture. But uh, lists in Scala are immutable. So we've kind of felt this throughout, uh, throughout all of your coding, throughout everything you've done. You kind of feel this by when you want to make a change to a list, you can't just make the change to that list because the size of that list, the number of elements in that list, the values of each element of the list, it's all immutable. You cannot change a list in Scala, at least the default list. There is a mutable list, but we don't like talking about mutable lists. Lists in Scala are immutable. So when you do something like, like this, you prepend one to this list. What that does is creates a brand new list with one prepended and then returns a reference to the brand new list. So you have to do something like that. Oh, I, damn it. I knew I'd mess something up. Uh, this shouldn't, the type shouldn't be here. We do list equals one prepended to that list. Just ignore the, the typing here. Uh, there's a cut and paste there. So you have to reassign that to your variable or else you don't see the change. So we've known this, we've been doing this all semester. Same with maps, maps are immutable. You, you need to reassign to your variable the reference to the new object that was created with the change applied because without the reassignment, list is just going to refer to the original list with only the value to. And that list can't change ever. It's immutable, can't change. Uh, same with using val, you set, assign this to a new list. This list referred to by the variable cannot change. You can't add any elements to it. You can't change that value to, can't do anything to it ever. That object on the heap is always going to be just a list containing the value to. And then if we want to change anything, we're going to create a new variable that 
is equal to a new list object with that change applied. And usually this assignment for, uh, for what we're talking about the, this week and last week, usually this assignment, assignments like this where there's a change being applied and reassigned to a new variable is usually happening across stack frames in recursive calls. So we can make as many reassignments as we want. As many reassignments as there are frames that we added to the stack or recursive calls that we made. That's how many reassignments we need. So we'll make those across stack frames. So we can't just do new list two, new list three, new list four. Uh, when do we stop? Well, we leave that up to recursion to declare our variables for us. So strings are also immutable. I erased all these slides and I saw that Paul's lecture question was about strings, so I have to talk about strings. Strings are also immutable. And strings, I've been lying to you all semester, strings are actually on the heap. Strings go on the heap and they are immutable. So whenever you make a change to a string, a new object of type string is created and then you have to assign that to a new variable because you can never actually change a string because it's immutable. Uh, in this class, I have mentioned this before, so I haven't been lying to you all semester. Um, in this class, we pretend that they go on the stack because that's how they behave. That's how immutable objects behave is the same way anything that goes on the stack. Like ints go on the stack, ints behave like an immutable object. Strings are immutable objects. They behave just like ints that go on the stack. Same thing, it just keeps things a lot simpler with strings because if we don't simplify strings like that, we have this choice of do we just not use strings until we talk about immutability or do we talk about immutability way early in the semester? in classes, we'd have to talk about classes, objects, and immutability before we introduce strings. And when faced with those options, we're like, eh, let's just pretend strings are on the stack and call it good. Uh, so that's what we do with strings. We just pretend they're on the stack for this class, but technically they are immutable objects on the heap. So let's get this out of the way. Now we've talked about strings. And then the rest of the lecture, we can talk about the memory diagram of that counter example. Yeah, lists and yeah. Yeah. Um, why are strings objects on? Why are strings objects on the heap? Uh, performance is my very short answer to that. Uh, performance. So, like, uh, for example, ints don't have to be on the heap because there's a finite, you know, number of, how do I want to say that? Uh, ints don't need to go on the heap because they're only a handful of bytes. Like, they're fixed length. They're going to be 32 bits. Uh, we know how much space they're going to take up, and it's not all that much. Strings, we could have very long strings. Sometimes you might read an entire file and put that whole string in memory. If that was on the stack, you would have a lot of stack space being used and you'd probably get a lot of stack overflows. So we got to put them over on the heap. And then since they're references, if I create another string with that same exact value, the compiler can say, ah, I see what's going on here. And instead of creating a new string, I'm just going to refer to the string you already created with that value. So the compiler can really optimize since they're both on the heap and immutable. It can say, you already created a string with the alphabet, and you're declaring a new variable with that same string. I'm just going to refer to the same object that already exists. And if you tried to create two objects on the heap that were identical strings, that wouldn't happen? S sometimes it will. So if you try to create two identical strings on the heap, Sometimes they'll be different, and sometimes they won't. It's up to how the compiler's optimizing. It depends on things that I don't understand, that I've never studied, to be honest. But sometimes they'll be the same, sometimes they'll be the different. It, different. If you did uh, AP Java at all, any of you who, who've done that, or any Java at all, they'll say never compare your strings using equal equal. Always use dot equals when you're comparing your strings. If, if you've done any Java where you're comparing strings, you've heard that. Hopefully, if, if uh, you're being instructed properly. 
<coughs> they're, they're going to say never use equal equal because equal equal in Java is going to compare the references and sometimes two identical strings will have different references and there will be a copy of them. In most cases, they should share that memory. Uh, but if the compiler didn't catch that one, they'll be in separate objects and equal equal will return false even though the strings are identical. So, but if you use dot equals, it'll actually compare the values. So there, there are situations where they will be duplicated. But it gives the compiler that chance. We, we don't want to set the compiler up for failure. So it gives the compiler a chance to optimize. How does appending to a Scala list work since they're immutable? Good question. Uh, poorly is the answer, is the short answer. Uh, appending to a list uh, is very is actually very slow. You have to copy the entire list. The entire list is copied. You have a list of a million elements, and you want to append an element to the end of it. You get another copy of that list of a million and one elements, and you need that much more heap space. It's a very bad thing to do. Very very uh, inefficient. If you prepend to a list, then that entire list of a million elements is preserved in its entirety. And then you create one node before that list, one new node, and it just refers to the head of the old list. And you reuse that entire old list. Uh, I'll, I'll cap it at that for now, but next, goodness, is that next week already? Yeah, ne next week is linked lists. Uh, we'll spend all week talking about that, and I'll give you all the details. We'll have slides and everything of why, uh, why we can preserve the list with prepend but not append. The short answer is that they're singly linked lists, which only refer, you know, I don't need to go down that road. We're, <laughs> I'll end up talking way too long about it. Um, but yeah, if you're not careful with your list, so, and you can do this. If in your pale blue dot code, when you're, if you are iterating over every city and you're using a list and you're appending something to that list for every single city, so just like read all the lines of the file and create a list of the lines of that file and write it once with append and run it and see how long it takes and write it again with prepend with the two colons instead of the colon plus write it again with prepend and see how long it takes you'll notice the difference it's significantly slower to use append than prepend yeah according to the memory diagram it doesn't create a new list because when, at least whenever I did the memory diagrams for lists, and I believe Paul's example that was referenced there, we're always prepending, not appending. We're not appending to the end of a list, we're prepending to the beginning of the list. And then we can reuse that old list. Uh, but if that doesn't make sense, it'll, we'll spend uh, a bit of time next week talking about it. Oh, because I'm still in presentation. All right, cool. Let's do the memory diagram. So I'm going to change that code a little bit just to make it a little more compact for the slide so I can fit the whole memory diagram here. I'm going to get rid of decrease, just do increase, and change my base case to n less than or equal to zero. So if somebody gives me a negative number, I just ignore it, just like I did in the other example on Friday. I'm just going to ignore negative numbers by putting them in the base case. So and I'm going to do two instead of 20 because I ain't putting 20 frames on the stack. It would actually be 60 frames. Not doing it. So I'm just going to increment by two. So I expect counter two dot print counter to be 12. I'm going to take a counter with the value 10 and add two to it and get a counter of 20. So I have a recursive method that's going to do that. The base case for this, if I'm saying this method is going to increase the value of this counter by n, if n is 0, you're saying here's a counter, increase the value of this counter by 0, I'm thinking base case. That's easy. I can increase that by 0. I'm just going to do nothing and just return the counter you gave me because you didn't ask me to do any work. So I'm just going to return the counter you gave me, problem solved. So base case should always be very simple, as simple as possible. For these examples, in, in 116, most of the recursion just so, unless I end up showing a really complex one by Friday, which I might, 
Uh, the base case might get a little more complex, but mostly the base case is going to be that easy. Do nothing. Can't get easier than that. Just return the counter that I was given. If n is not 0, if n is greater than 0, I have some work to do. So I'm going to think of the l least amount of work I have to do to be able to make a recursive call that's closer to the base case. For that, I'm going to call counter.increase one time. You're asking me to call this increase ten, uh, n times. I'm going to call it once, and then I'm going to make a recursive call that says, hey, I called this one time. Can you call it n minus one times? If you could, that'd be great. And then I'm just going to return whatever that recursive call returns. So to start off, this starts off just like any other object creation that we've done. And mind you, we're going back on the heap. I, I, I really like the way the memory diagrams pan out because recursion is all about the stack. We have to remember how the stack works. Mutable objects is all about the heap. We've got to remember how the heap works. Uh, but nothing as complex as the stuff we did near the end of OOP where we have the multiple constructor calls and I had the slide just filled with stuff. We get a little more space on the slide to work with here. So it starts off just like those. I'm going to call the constructor. Constructor gets a reference to the object that's being created. We do put all the constructor parameters on the stack inside that stack frame for the constructor. And these variables in the constructor also become state variables for the object that's being created. So all that's review. And then if, I had this question, so I just want to make sure I re, uh, refresh on this. If there's something outside of any of the methods, if there's a variable declared outside of any methods, that becomes a state variable of the object. So if I declared some value uh, right in between the lines for with class and def, if I said val x equals 7, then x with a value of 7 would be a state variable in the object in the heap but that x would not be on the stack. That x never makes it to the stack. It's only the constructor parameters make it onto the stack. But anything, constructor parameters and the variables declared outside of any methods, both make it to the heap. So a small distinction, I consider a very small error on a quiz, um, but it is a distinction. Those uh, anything outside of the methods, don't go on the stack. Uh, so good review for LO2, those of you taking the quiz this week too, I suppose. All right, that returns, we get our counter, and I have my 350 highlighted properly there. Missed one, but. All right, so now we're going to make our call to update counter. This is eventually going to return into counter2, which I expect to be a counter with the value 12 with a counter variable with a value 12. And hopefully we get there. I'm confident. Uh, n is 2. Counter is counter, which I'm purposely reusing the, the name counter here so we can see counters that are on the heap, counters that store ints, counters that store references, counters that are on the, the stack. Um, counter is this counter, which is the reference 350. So counter goes to counter inside the stack frame as a parameter and has the value 350, the reference 350, which is a reference to the only counter that's currently on the heap. So we checked our base case, said, do I have to do anything? The answer is yes, because n equals 2. So now we hit the recursive call, but we have a little work to do before we make the recursive call. We have to subtract 1 from n. OK, that's easy enough. But we have to call counter.increase. This is that little amount of work that we're actually going to do during this recursive call, during this recursive step. So we call increase one time. And then we're going to say update counter recursively call increase one more time, because then it'll be one at that point. So let's call counter.increase. Oh. And we want to do as little work as possible. I'll, I'll, I'll go with my slide here. We want to do as little work as possible to get closer to that base case. If my objective is to call increase n times, I'm going to call it one time. That's the littlest amount of work that I can do to get closer to my base case. I'm going to call increase one time. 
and then set up my recursion based on the fact that I've called it one single time. Uh, do you have to draw the arrows anymore? I'd say for LO3, I, I wouldn't care anymore about the arrows for the references, as long as the references match. Uh, for LO2, it's strongly recommended, but I'd say if you didn't have your arrows but all your references match, uh, if that's the only thing and the grader was like, this is garbage, you didn't have your arrows, uh, come to me and I'll, I'll reverse that decision, as long as everything you have is correct and your references match. I strongly recommend still having your arrows because if you write the wrong reference one time and you don't have arrows, it's an easy mistake to make, and at that point, you know, I'm not helping you out because you made an actual mistake. Where if you draw your arrows, but you have the wrong number for the reference, it, it, you know, that's a hard mistake to make, to draw the arrow to the wrong object. Uh, you're not going to make that mistake if you have everything the way it's supposed to be. Yeah? You said you're calling it once. Isn't it twice? Eventually, we're going to call it twice. I'm only calling it once for now. So we need to make a recursive call, and that recursive call is going to call it another time. And then at that point, we sh would expect to hit our base case because we've already called it twice. And then we can start returning up the recursion. So eventually, we'll call it twice. So the problem with calling it, if I just called it twice here, what happens when I change this back to 20? Am I going to call it 20 times? Like I can't do that dynamically in the code. So I'm going to use recursion to make sure the recursion puts 20 frames on the stack, each of which is going to call increase one time. So each stack frame, each recursive call, I'm doing a minimal amount of work to get closer to the base case. And then if I'm farther away from the base case, I'm going to get more recursive calls. And each recursive call only does one little bit of work. So that's the goal of this setup. So we're going to call increase. That's a frame on the stack. Increase was called through counter from this stack frame. Counter is the reference 350. And then counter is going to create a new counter and then return a reference to the counter with this dot counter 10 plus 1. So we would expect a new counter to be created with a counter variable of 11. So we're getting closer to 12. So we call the constructor, a new counter is being created. So this is a reference to the object that's being created at this point. So we have a new object on the heap. That's what we expect from immutability. If we're making a change, we don't ever change that first counter. We're going to create a new counter with the change applied. So we're getting new objects on the heap every time we want to simulate a change to an object. Exactly. Recommended, not required. I would draw my arrows for LO2 personally because I know, I know myself, I'm going to accidentally write 200 here instead of 350, and now everything blows up. Like You're actually wrong at that point. But if I write 200 here and there's an arrow pointing to this guy, I'm overlooking that during grading. I'm like, oh yeah, they just wrote the wrong number, but they knew what they were talking about because the arrow's pointing to the right thing. Uh, make it harder for us to not give you credit on the quizzes. If you have references and arrows, it's going to be hard for you to know, both know what you're talking about and not get credit for the thing. Because uh, those small errors don't really matter if you have the arrows. So we're creating that new counter, returning it. It doesn't get returned in any value. It just gets returned into this stack frame. And then that stack frame is returning that reference. And then that's returned to this call in this stack frame. So the increase call returned the reference 200. And then we call update counter, add a recursive call to the stack with n minus 1, n is 2, so n of 1, and whatever counter.increase returned, which counter returned the reference 200, so increase. All it did was return whatever this constructor returns, which was the reference 200. So counter is 200, a reference to the new counter that was created.
And then we do the whole thing again. Okay, so we, we made a recursive call, n equals 1, which is not less than or equal to 0. We had our recursive step again. That calls counter.increase. That calls new counter, calls the constructor. We got a whole bunch of frames on the stack. We have the main stack frame, a recursive a call to update counter, a recursive call to update counter, a call to increase, a call to the counter constructor, all on the stack right now. And the constructor, at this moment in time, the constructor is the only one that's active. It's the last frame on the stack. So this creates a new counter. This is a reference to the counter that's being created. It's going to return that reference. Uh, same thing, uh, this constructor, this dot counter from this stack frame, this dot counter 11 plus 1 is going to be 12. Return that reference, return that reference. So update counter, and this stack frame is going to call update counter of 1 minus 1 and the reference 480. These two stack frames return. This gets that reference 480 and makes that call. Update counter, n equals 0, counter is 480. Any questions up to this point? Now we're about to hit the base case and unroll all this stuff. Okay. So now we have a, a recursive call. We have three calls to update counter on the stack. These two are just waiting for the return value so they can return it. This one finally hit the base case. The base case is true. So we're just going to return counter. And this is the setup that we use when we have an accumulator variable. A few of my, when I was in the solutions and I had my code collapse and everything, I set up an accumulator variable that was initialized to an empty list or an empty map. When we're using an accumulator variable, what we're doing is accumulating when we go down the recursive calls. So every time I make a new recursive call, I have a reference to a counter with one additional value added. One call of increase has been processed. And then when I get down to the base case, I'm just going to return the accumulator variable. Wherever I've been accumulating my answer, I'm just going to return it. So I finally have a call that says, hey, can you increase the value of this counter zero times? Just return it. In our case here, it already has the value 12, which is what we're after. So I'm just going to return it. Just return that value. That returns up to this recursive call. All this recursive call was waiting for was the recursive call that it made to return. So it gets the return value 480, and it just returns it. Up to the other recursive call, it gets the return value 480, and it just returns it. Back to the main method, encounter2 gets the reference 480, which is this counter with the value 12. So now counter, when we print this value, counter still refers to that original counter. It's immutable. It can't change. So we don't expect it to change, and it did not change. Still has the value 10. So we get the value 10 printed to the screen from counter. Counter 2, 480, has that value 12, which has that increase called two times through all that recursion, through the recursion that happened. The same process would happen if this were, say, 5. We're just going to repeat this whole process five times. So each time we repeat the process, increase is called one time. If this is 5, we get the whole process five times, five recursive calls, each calling increase a single time. And that's how we get our dynamic code. You want to call a method n number of times, we're going to put n frames on the stack. Each frame does one piece of work, one little bit of work. And then if I have n of them, I've done n amount of work. And in this case, I've called increase n times. Yeah. Is there a reason I called increase instead of adding parameters? So I could just say increase of uh, n, and then just add n instead of 1. Uh, yeah, the reason I didn't do it is just to set up recursion and talk about recursion more. This is a completely artificial example. You just say int uh, counter of type int uh, as a variable. Like, that's how you would do this in real life. Uh, you wouldn't do any of this stuff. But I just want to talk about recursion and immutability. Yep. 
the middle counter doesn't have anything referencing it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's still technically on the heap. But, kind of, yeah. But also, like, Scala does, like, cleanup. Right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, so this middle counter with the value 11, we have no reference to that counter anymore. It's kind of on the heap still. In your memory diagrams, it should still be on the heap. But Scala is going to do what's called garbage collection. And since, since we don't have any way of referring to that object anymore, we have no way of accessing it, Scala is going to recognize that and free up that memory and delete it. So this is why when you have, like if you write a loop that appends to a list um, like a million or two million times, that's a bad example because that might work. Uh, let's say a billion times, or uh, I don't know, a trillion times. Let's just, no, that doesn't work either. What am I thinking of? So if you append to a list a million times, yeah, a million works. So a million times, you're creating a million copies of that list, each with one extra element. So what you end up with is a total of n squared over 2-ish elements on uh, integers on the heap which is a million squared should be a trillion, which is going to be larger than your RAM, if I did my math right. I think I did. Um, but it's going to be larger than your RAM. But uh, the single final list is going to be a million elements, which certainly fits in RAM that's you know, on the order of megabytes. Not, not that much memory uh, for the final list. That code will actually run because the garbage collection is going to keep cleaning up those lists. It'll take a while to run, but the garbage collection will clean up all those lists so you don't actually have uh, all that memory on there. I'm definitely doing my math wrong there. What am I doing wrong? There's no way that takes a terabyte if you, if you do it the wrong way. I don't know, whatever a million squared is. It is a terabyte. No, that's working right, right? A million squared is a trillion, right? Yeah. I'm not doing anything dumb there? Okay. Yeah, that's, but, it, but it won't take a terabyte of space because it'll keep doing garbage collection. All right, any questions? I, I had another thing I wanted to do, but there's zero chance I can do it in a minute. So any other questions? We already did the lecture question, so see you all Wednesday.